Hi, this is Marie Goodwin from um, Code Pink. I'm the local peace economy coordinator for Code Pink. And today I wanted to welcome um, some people I really admire. Uh, Shari Stuber from Transition Town Greater Media. Uh, she's one of the main stewards, uh, one of the founders of Transition Town Greater Media, uh, and it was founded 15 years ago, a long time ago, and has been very successful. And um, Julie Smith, who is uh, working with uh, Transition Town Greater Media on projects relating to um, local agriculture, uh, local um, local plants and um, greening spaces in the town. And I wanted them to come today to talk about how transition and um, how transition towns work and how effective they are um, as, with bringing community together. And so uh, with that, I'd like to welcome Shari Stuber. Thanks, Marie. And uh, thanks uh, to Code Pink for inviting us today. I love spreading the word about transition towns. It's one of my favorite subjects and something that I've devoted the last 15 or 16 years to. Um, so I'll just jump in by uh, starting with what transition towns are about. Um, so the transition movement is a hyperlocal international movement. And if that sounds a little paradoxical, um, it's really about individual towns that are working at the local level, but they're supported by a network that, that links these towns together at regional, national, and international levels, sharing information, uh, sharing ideas, successes, concerns, and trainings, like how to run effective meetings, how to run a solarized program, how to run a uh, repair cafe, and how to talk to people about climate change that leaves them inspired rather than depressed. Things like that. Um, transition, the, the name transition itself is, is somewhat confusing to a lot of people. Um, they kind of wondering what, trans, what we're transitioning from and to. Um, so just to make that a little bit clearer, um, we're, we're transitioning from a society that's dependent on fossil fuels, an economy that's based on the extraction of natural resources as if they have no limits or repercussions, and the exploitation of people, starting with the indigenous people whose lands we stole, and the African slaves and immigrants from many other countries whose work built this economy, but who have always been vilified and treated as if they're uh, somewhat less than human. And finally, we're transitioning from the mindset that um, has, that underlies all of this, that we're separate beings in a, in a, a dangerous world. We're in competition with each other and in a conflict with the, the natural world. And in order to survive, we need to control and dominate the world around us, which of course leads to feelings of fear and isolation and alienation. So our vision is for um, a simpler, cleaner, healthier, more connected, thriving community that where people care about and trust each other. And nature is an abundant and nurturing partner, helping us to maintain a healthy and happy life. A world in which everybody wins and everything wins. So to do this, we. Uh, our mission is really to work towards a regenerative economy that heals the wounds of the past and restores the vitality of the soil, the air, the water, the ecosystems, and the people. And this requires a multifaceted approach, which has always been a hallmark of transition. We work on expanding access to local food, support local economy, reducing energy use, especially that based on fossil fuels, reducing waste, protecting and restoring biodiversity, building community, promoting local uh, social justice, and supporting people's well-being through through inner work. So it's not it's not about solving individual problems, which often results in unintended consequences that may do damage in one area while fixing another. It's really about seeing the world as a whole paradigm based on 
that's based on an outdated worldview and taking a more systematic approach to introduce a new paradigm. So we work to find alternatives to the status quo and create the world that we'd like to live in as a model for others to emulate. Um, I can go into a little bit of the history of Transition Town Greater Media, if you like, or if you want to interject something here. Yeah, I wanted to uh, talk about the like uh, the history of like where the transition idea began and how it kind of spread around the world, because I think that's a really interesting, um, an interesting story mm -hmm. about where transition yes. began. Um, so the transition movement started in England in 2006, and it was based on um, a permaculture t uh, course in Kinsale, Ireland, that looked at the problem of peak oil and um, in climate change and tried to introduce permaculture topics uh, to the level of community. So they based a, um, a whole trend, uh, energy descent action plan uh, for the, the town of Kinsale to divest themselves of fossil fuel dependency and create a more um, sustainable life uh, that was still enjoyable. So that um, was really the spark that, that uh, started the whole movement. Going back to England, uh, Rob Hopkins, the founder of Transition Towns, um, decided that it was a, an idea that, that could be applied also to his hometown of Totnes. So he um, started working uh, on creating that, getting a, a group together um, of like-minded people. He wrote the Transition Handbook, which was a manual on how to start Transition Towns in 2006. And, um, and uh, sort of to his surprise, he, it spread very quickly through England and then, and then uh, through Europe as well. And it jumped over to the United States. Um, there was a, a surge of interest in Transition Towns in the United States between 2008 and 2009. A lot of transition towns sprang up all over the country. Um, sadly, many of them has dissolved after a few years. Uh, transition Town Greater Media was the 39th transition town in the U.S. and the first one in Pennsylvania when we became official in 2009. Um, and it's and, still going. So and it's still the, going. <laughs> that's something really amazing. And yeah. I mean, I know that there are others that are still going too, but it really takes an enormous amount of dedicated leadership and commitment to within the community. And th that kind of, those stories that come from tradition town, greater media are, I think, really inspiring. Like how, how do you continue the momentum? Like what, what, how do you gauge people? How do you bring um, new people in? Because I'm sure that there's, people revolving in and out all the time. There's a revolving door of, of people who work and yeah. then step back because of family and their lives. Like, how do you sustain that commitment? Well, it's really pretty interesting. I think a lot of our success came from really taking the transition model seriously. Um, the, the whole idea of it being um, a systematic approach to, uh, to the problems uh, that we're facing today. Um, Rob Hopkins, in his um, transition handbook, set out some really clear and doable guidelines on how to create a successful transition town, um, starting with awareness groups, uh, events, sorry, um, to attract like-minded people and um, having them join us and, and, and start creating projects. Also reaching out to other organizations that are doing compatible work in our, in our community to lend support to their efforts and find ways to collaborate. So it sort of um, increases our effectiveness and our reach. Um, and then starting after starting with these awareness raising events, we um, start creating working groups and they sort of naturally evolved. The first one of course was uh, around food. I think that's always a very, um, uh, an, an issue that brings in a lot of people. Uh, in our very first meeting of the um, uh, food group in, me in Transition Town Greater Media, we talked about creating a farmer's market. And um, it was something that had been tried several times before and just never really got off the ground. 
But um, after that meeting, a group of, I think, four women decided to go for it. And six months later, there was an outdoor farmer's market in the middle of media. And uh, we were all pretty excited about that. Like, oh, our first success. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it happens sort of easily, you know, in a sense. Um, so it was very, it was very encouraging. Um, but basically all of our, our projects started that way. It, you know, some people have an idea and they uh, get together with others who like the idea and go for it. And um, in a lot of different projects were created that way. We also, um, one of the, one of the um, organizations that we've collaborated with a lot is the, is the Media Environmental Advisory Council, which is a group of volunteers uh, who report to the Borough Council on environmental matters. And uh, we've, so we did a lot of um, initial uh, projects with them, uh, put on events with them, things around uh, rain barrels and home energy uh, assessments and audits and, uh, and things like that. Um, we, one of the first things we did for them was to bring them someone who was interested in uh, and doing a carbon footprint analysis of media as part of his uh, college uh, thesis, uh, senior thesis. And they were very excited about that. And so we were, they uh, really welcomed us with open arms uh, since then. Um, but other projects like that have come up. Um, what, um, I think one of the first things as well is uh, when you, Marie, came to us in 2010 with the idea of starting a time bank. And that was a really exciting thing for us to take on. It seemed like a really big project at the time. And, um, and in fact, it inspired us to become a 501c3. But it was a huge success, partly, mostly probably due to your efforts and dedication. Um, and even though it actually did ended up not working out for long, it, um, it didn't really seem like a good fit for our community. It really did move us forward in thinking bigger um, big, for bigger that sorts of things. Yeah, alternative, uh, you know, economic systems, alternative currencies, um, sharing um, of resources outside of the war economy system that um, demands that we commodify everything, I, I feel like is one way to get people's minds into this transition that you're encouraging by your work. Um, in a really fundamental way, because it requires people to think about money and access to goods and materials and services in a really whole new way, other than just paying for it and being done with it. You have to build relationships to get your needs met instead of just paying for it with money. And so I feel like even though it's it's like a, it's a project, it's also a, a shift in mindset around getting your needs and wants met um, and it's a form of mutual aid. Mutual aid networks are popping up all over the country. And I think that that is a, um, that that's kind of the ultimate next step to that kind of work, you know? Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. And, and in uh, the local peace economy workbook that we have, there, there is a, a pivot that we have around, and you were just talking about this, it's called problem solving to managing complexities that, you, that, you know, instead of just looking at problems and trying to solve the problems directly and then realizing that sometimes there's unintended consequences when you solve one problem, like four pop up, that, that the complexities of looking at problems and how you engage with them seems to be really core to the ethos of what Transition Town is trying to do. Instead of just taking action without thinking you know, about it and feeling into it and welcoming in co-conspirators and collaborators and and bringing in other points of view, like that's what you're doing instead of just trying to say, here's a problem, we'll solve it. Here's a problem, we'll solve it, you know? Um, and that's something that I really appreciate about Transition Town, um, that that ethos of really co collecting a, the local wisdom and seeing what emerges from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, Julie- Go ahead, Shari. Oh, I'm sorry. That was another um, important aspect of transition, the transition movement. It's um, based on a head, hands, and heart approach. So the head part obviously would be um, 
understanding what the problems are and really the whole gamut of problems and how they interact and how they um, support each other uh, and, and basically what they are based on, which is again, the whole story of separation. Um, and, and then part and the other part, the heart is uh, basically coming to grips with how this affects us and how we were really sort of um, uh, almost, you know, uh, brain, uh, brainwashed into thinking in terms of uh, competition and separation and um, being in conflict with others, you know, there's only so much pie and we have to, you know, fight each other for, for our slice of it. Um, and then the hands, of course, are doing the actual projects of, um, of uh, making the kind of alternatives that we want to see in the world and, and uh, having visible projects that um, people can say, hey, there's another way we could do this. It's not, it doesn't have to be the way it used to be. Yeah. So Julie, can you tell me a little bit about how you got involved with Transition Town Media and what you've worked on and discovered through your work? Sure, um, I've been part of Transition Town now a little over a year. I knew the leaders and a lot of the people in Transition Town, Transition Town Greater Media for a while, but I hadn't gotten involved until another or local organization that Transition Town had partnered with a lot dissolved and Transition Town Greater Media gave the initiatives that I really felt were important to the town a home. So I got involved because Transition Town welcomed the Green Wagon Project and Tree Tenders and Bee City. So they're the three things that I'm involved with. And um, the, they all, the part that I love about Transition Town is that they say yes and that they turn uh, hopelessness into hopefulness. Um, it was the Tree Tenders and the Green Wagon both came from a place of feeling very helpless and hopeless in the town when we're watching all of the trees come down and very large homes being built. And instead of just crawling into a corner, it was a oh, wait, but we can put our feet on the ground and do something. We can grow a community and there are other people who want to do better. So the Green Wagon Project um, is we just use old wagons. So we take things that probably would have been in the trash and paint them green and build shelves out of old wood and we put um, native plants on curbs. So we had, this year we had eight wagons out around town and they, we just offered native plants and all sorts of information on how to make your yard healthier and happier and just the importance of native plants for the biodiversity crisis and for curbing climate change because they are extremely beneficial. And just, it became a network of a bunch of people all working together for a greater good. And the same with tree tenders. Um, it's a wonderful program through the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society. They train anybody. I mean, the person who started that is a social worker and she saw the value of trees for um, environmental justice and how trees bring communities together. People tend to sit out on their porches more if they have a nice tree in the shade in the city. And she wanted to bring those trees into neighborhoods. So she invites everybody from all walks of life, any type of neighborhood, to learn how to care for and plant trees. And um, a bunch of us in town have taken the course. And now through Transition Town, we're all certified tree tenders. And we, thanks to Transition Town, there's no um, boundaries as far as finances or anything. We plant trees for people for free. We provide the labor for free. But the other part that's really great is that we invite the homeowners, children, anybody who wants to be part of it to come out and people find us. It's feet on the ground. Same with the wagons where people see us walking around or they see us planting trees and they say, who are you? Where are you from? How can I get involved? And that's been one of the greatest things is we've had now we're, we're cleaning up a park. We have, I'm sorry, I'm going off on a tangent, but um, the Green Wagon Project, we have a couple of other split offs from that. Um, Habitat helpers came from, that's the part I love about Transition Town is that they say yes to anything. So if you have an idea, they say, yes, go ahead, run with it. So <laughs> this year we also started Habitat Helpers because we recognize that people may really want to plant native plants or really want to be part of this, but they don't have the ability or they don't have the time. So the, the idea of Habitat Helpers was to provide people with the resources or the person to come out in their yard and help them plant 
So we wound up helping to plant um, a native garden for Sterling Nursing Home. And then we also help clean up parks because we want to keep people from planting the native plants. So we want to help them maintain them. So people will see us cleaning up a park and say, hey, where are you from? What organization are you with? So it's really nice to just be visible. And um, it's it's just been an unbelievably positive experience being part of this group. It just, when Shari was talking, it made me tear up just thinking about how amazing this group of people is and how it's just growing. It's just getting better. It's it's really inspiring to, uh, especially to hear about how you can, if you're visibly out in your community, like rooted in the work that you're doing, like it, it, it's always seemed to me that's like, I mean, yeah, there are tabling events and things like this where you're trying to get people involved, but really why people get involved is because they see other people doing work in the community that they notice and that matters to them. And then they they feel inspired to take that next step for themselves, right? And that to bring people in and that you're just doing the work that you're out there to do. You're out there planting trees or you're planting native gardens and, you know, I wouldn't say minding your own business, but kind of minding your own business and doing your project and that people see the change happens when people are inspired by the actions of others as examples. I really think instead of like preaching to people, like, oh, like that, that, that doesn't like filling them with facts and figures all the time. Like that doesn't make change like science, you know, there's all these studies that show that that actually entrenches people into like poor beliefs or to other belief to the belief systems they already hold. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you are just out enacting your work in the world, in your local community, grounded on your, the sidewalk, you know, in front of you that, that you can, help bring people into this larger change. And um, I've, I've always found that really inspiring about transition work. And it really dovetails really well in with the local peace economy work. Uh, I mean, transition towns and local peace economy, there's like very little separation between the, the ethos between both. Um, Mm -hmm. But that, 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 that rootedness to place is essential to the transition work. Um, yeah, so can you talk to me a little bit about how, um, other than just being out in the world doing your work, how else do you bring people who might feel um, discouraged or apathetic or, um, um, you know, um, unable to engage with the work? How else have you seen uh, transition bring people in other than just setting an example are there other ways like I know you do tabling events and things like that but like what other ways have you brought people in yeah um, I mean we do do tabling events and that uh, you know frankly that's that's one that I uh, dislike the most because um, as an introvert and, and just sitting at a table waiting for people to come up to you to ask you what you do <laughs> is uh, is my idea of hell. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and it's thoroughly exhausting. So, um, but but being out and doing things like Julie was saying and, and actually just doing the work uh, and having other people come up and, and talk to you about what you're doing is, is to me is just fun. And, and really enjoyable, but um, uh, we also have, um, uh, you know, at some of our other events, we uh, get people to come and hear about what we're doing without it being so preachy. Um, so we've brought, done things, for example, um, a gratitude event uh, that we uh, often do in, in November around Thanksgiving time is uh, was something that brought together a bunch of uh, organizations, local organizations in the media area and, um, and and gave them sort of a platform just to talk about what they're doing and um, it, you know and why people should should join them and all that sort of thing. And it actually turns out to be um, the the, net, the organizations that came were were really happy to to uh, to participate in this kind of event because, not only were they able to let other people know about what they're doing, they were able to network with each other. And that was a a really big plus in their eyes. And, and by doing an event like that, we also get some recognition as, as a, as an organization that is interested in what other groups are doing and, and, and want to, you know, support and uplift 
um, all the great things that are happening in the in the community. Um, we also have a wonderful a wonderful event that Julie's been a big part of called EcoFest. Um, in this in the in late September we put on this uh, little festival in one of our little pocket parks. Um, again, bringing together organizations to table and and uh, put on activities and and do little demos and so on. Um, but all environment all uh, groups that are in involved with environmental and ecological uh, uh, work. So um, and again, I mean, it's a it's a really joyful event. Lots you know we have lots of families and young kids and um, people from all all over come and uh, even if they weren't didn't know what was happening, they'll see something's going on and they come over and and check it out. Um, and again, the the organizations that are there often say, you know, it was great to see that somebody else was doing this kind of work and I could, we could, you know, share uh, information and, um, and you know, do a little bit of collaborating as well. So it's another way of bringing, bringing people together and, um, and creating uh, connections that maybe otherwise wouldn't have been connected. Yeah, I really love that, um, that relational uh, view of community instead of transition town sort of centering itself as like, you know, an important nonprofit in town. It's essentially saying we're just going to create this space for other nonprofits who are doing interesting work. And we live in, in a town that is filled with people doing pretty interesting work. Yeah. And, and and we're going to highlight the achievements of other people. We're going to take, we're just going to organize the event, but we're going to take a back seat to centering our work for this time. And we're going to, we're going to provide a forum for you. And I've always really loved that about Transition Town Media, about that centering of others and um, the welcoming aspect, even if nobody, you know, um, becomes you know involved or starts joining groups or anything like that that's not the focus we're not trying to manipulate people into participating in our 501c3 it's really about like sharing resources and um and uh, I, i've always appreciated that about transition town media and um greater media i the name changed for people who are listening the name changed and <laughs> when i was participating in it which was many years ago it was transition town media and i have this habit um I wanted to pivot a little bit to uh, something from the workbook. There's a there's a, a whole part about um, really looking about how we might center our creativity um, in the place where we are instead of the consumption. And Charles Eisenstein, we talked about this a lot when I when I was working in the um, in transition town media, and I, that where we really wanted to. Um, center community uh, not around co-consumption because that's not really community but co-creativity build, building things together being creative together uh, supporting each other's creativity um, that that's a, a really key and essential pivot to building building community and celebrating each other and so um, we just you just had media just had um, the local Green Sunday event and so I wanted to know if one of you would talk about Green Sunday and the creativity and supporting local artists and community around local artists. That'd be great. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It's one of our uh, really fun events as well um, that we do every year. It's a t This year was our 13th. <laughs> um, so Green Sunday was basically uh, an effort to bring together local artists and artisans and craft people um, to, to sell, uh, to have like a holiday craft fair. Um, where they could sell their wares and people could get to know just exactly what kinds of um, creative people are living in uh, this area. So we um, we ch tend to have 50, 50 different um, artists and, um, and they range from making jewelry to uh, making wonderful woodcraft uh, kind of um, items. Um, and just just an um, enormous and working in fabric and all kinds of different um, things. Some of them are just so inventive. Like we, there's one woman who uses old books and she kind of does some uh, cutting and pasting of them that, and they create these these art objects out of pages of books. <laughs> it's just amazing. 
Um, we've had one person who melted down uh, glass bottles and turned them into trays and and um, uh, stuff like that. So it's it's really quite amazing how many people are doing just really beautiful things. And and I think it's um it's 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 a a bit of a fundraiser for us, but more than that, it's really just a way of people coming together to support local business and to and to um and to support an economy that is not uh, online and, you know, putting money outside of the community. It keeps the, it keeps the wealth inside the community and, and spreads it around. Yeah. For every dollar, I don't think people know this, for every dollar you spend on Amazon or online, one cent goes back to the local community for every dollar you spend at uh, a Target or a box store, it's like 20 cents or something like that comes back to the local community. And for every dollar you spend in a local business, it's 67 cents stays in the local community. And for Green Sunday, I think it's probably 100% or I close so. to <laughs> 100 Pretty cents much. out of 100 stays. <laughs> and and that's important that because that's with supporting your neighbors, you know, that's supporting the the people who who in turn support you. And so um, that is a real shift, right, in the way we think about local economies as um, how to really support our local artists and artisans and creatives and give them an outlet. Um, and it's something that's close to my heart because I've started recently really, I've been essentially apprenticed to a potter here in town and I'm working in porcelain and making pottery and and I'm not ready quite yet to sell, but I will be at some point. And so this is okay. a... This is a local, this is, this to me is really important. You know, this is a, I, the, the people who I would like to be able to sell to is not somebody in California. I would like to have my pot sit in the homes of people I know, right? And, <laughs> and be in my community instead of shipping them all over. So um, that's, um, that feels um, more nourishing to me. Yes. Um, well, we'd so, love to have you at Green Sunday. When you're yeah, ready. well, maybe next year. <laughs> I mean, so another Julie, way, another way that we support local business, though, is uh, we have a, a circle of aunts and uncles, which uh, has created a donor um, a donor created fund, loan fund that we use to uh, give loans to local businesses um, who are maybe start just starting out or or uh, needing some extra capital that um, they wouldn't be able to get from a bank because they don't have the right sorts of collateral and uh, and so on. So uh, at the at the moment, we cur are currently have given out loans to three three different businesses, all of all of whom in Chester, um, which is our, of course our uh, nearby city, which is uh, about eighty five percent, I think, black, and um, and rather impoverished. So supporting local businesses there is is really important to us because having having Chester really um, create their own economy and really booster, uh, bolster their own work and, and get to know each other as neighbors who can supply your needs is really a, a very important part of our, um, of our ethos. Um, and that's and why it, it was called greater media, right? Because Chester is very close exactly. by. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think there was a recognition that, our our community involvement uh, doesn't just have to be within the little borough. Our borough is, you know, like one square mile. It's very a small little town, um, but that we the impact of what media the transition town was um, was having was a, on a much greater in a much greater place than just this little community. That we could have mm. an impact and participate and call in people from other other local communities. So my, right. my, my assumption is that that's why is that. Yeah. Area. I mean, we've always thought of it being the greater media area, not just the borough itself, but um, anyone who was close enough by to, um, to come in and join us in any event or activity or anything that we wanted, they wanted to participate in. But it turned out that people were thinking, oh, it's just media. Um, so I live in Aston, so I can't participate. And we're like, no, 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 that's not the way it works. <laughs> So uh, we felt that changing the name would would help uh, encourage other people to see that. Oh no, it's not just the the borough; it's the whole area. Yeah. 
Julie, can you talk a little bit about what it's like to be an organizer and uh, somebody who's volunteering and giving their time and having a family with, you know, a young family and the some of the work that you're doing, some of the challenges of that and some of, because it, I mean, it's challenging for anybody to fit this work in, but like what called you to do the work essentially? Like, you know, it, I guess it was the the local plants and your participation in these other um, nonprofits, but what called you to pull, to just trans transpose your enthusiasm to Transition Town? And then how has that worked for you in the last year? So um, I'll start off by saying I would, I'm, it's hard to believe, but I am a very shy person. So I never would have felt that I would be in this role. Um, but the number one reason that I got involved is my kids and hope because I know that this is a world that I'm going to have to hand off. We're all gonna be handing off to the next generation and I don't wanna leave them a mess. I wanna make it as good as I possibly can. So I sacrifice time now with them in order to make the world a little better. Um, it is challenging. The good thing is that a lot of the, the initiatives that I do with the planting and the volunteering, they and my kids have helped with Green Sunday, carrying tables, and I do bring my kids to absolutely everything I can. And I feel like they've learned an awful lot by doing that and being, my son just got inducted into the National Junior Honor Society and he needed to get like eight volunteer hours. And I was like, wait, you've got that more than come. <laughs> so he's just been a volunteer. I mean, we started at an animal shelter when he was four months old, he was coming and I push him in a stroller. So my kids just I, I feel like that's a very important thing for my family is to give back to the community. And um, like I said, I'm very invested in the natural world. And I have this um, this connection. I, I just, am, I don't know if it's the empath in me or how emotional I am, but I have a very strong connection to the natural world and the outside world. And watching it disappear in my own little neighborhood was very hard. And now I have a way to work with other people in my community who want to make it a better world too. So it is hard. It's balancing. It's sometimes there's really late nights. Sometimes I give up weekends. Um, my husband and I sometimes have, sometimes I have to take a step back and my husband's like, wait, you're doing too much. I need you to come back to me for a little while and come back to the family. And, um, so we take a step back. I'll take a break and regroup and, um, transition town is really supportive with that too. And one thing that I find very helpful that I started doing this year was when I send an email out because there's all through the planting season, there are so many things to do. I was trying to send an email out every weekend and something that I learned from tree tenders that I repeat all of the time that I think is the best thing to say is these are all opportunities, not obligations. So these are all of the opportunities we have this week. If you have an hour or two to put in, we'd love to have you. If you don't, don't feel guilty. We know everybody has lives. Everybody has things. And that worked. I think people not having that pressure, we did get a good number of volunteers for everything throughout the season. And we had another successful season. So it is a lot of balancing act. And sometimes I go too far and I grab because I do get excited about everything. I mean, everything the transition town is doing, I'm interested in, even though I work mainly in the biodiversity realm. I love the community building. I love supporting other communities. I love everything about it. Um, so it's hard to say no and know when to back off. So it is a constant balancing act of, okay, am I, is this a good amount of stuff or should I step back? And my husband's yeah. trying to help me a little bit. My partner is really good at, <laughs> I feel like I have a partner in that. <laughs> yeah. Having, having a good partnership is, is really, really important to allow you to ebb and flow back into it. And that's, that's super important. And, and, and also being able to set your own boundaries. I think that's super important because there's so much work that needs to be done, um, you know, in the world. And we, um, we, we can't do it all, you know, we can only do with, I think this is my philosophy of what's right in front of us. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, and that the, um, and feeling the pressure of a world on fire um, can sometimes overwhelm people into feeling apathy or helplessness or um, that, that they have no power. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that that comes from a misunderstanding of how change actually happens in the world. Right. We think that change, it happens because we exert a force on something and then it changes, but that kind of isn't the way that change works, especially in this 
activism that's rooted in your local economy. And so realizing your own boundaries and the and what you have to give in that moment every day when you wake up and go, what can I give today? Mm -hmm. um, is a really um, thoughtful way to do activism. So I applaud you on that. <laughs> um, okay. I wanted to pivot to, so there's another pivot in the local economies workbook about um, the, the way that our culture glorifies the accumulation of resources, accumulation, consumption, consumerism, and um, the, the, the peace economy that is be, trying to be born in things like through transition town and mutual aid networks and time banks and all of the, the activity that's going on to build a peace economy that, that sharing of resources, um, gift giving of resources, um, that that is the, that seems to be a mode that uh, that heals wounds and to, and provides for people. Can either of you talk a little bit about that within the context of transition towns? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I I meant to apologize earlier. My cat usually likes to join me on Zoom calls. She gets that's most very welcome. jealous. Of most welcome. By talking to other people, <laughs> the more than human world is always <laughs> welcome. <laughs> um. Yeah, so another one of our areas of, um, of work is uh, what one of our members used to call collaborative consumption. And um, this, thing, this started with a project uh, that we did. Media has this uh, strange um, tradition of having a uh, garage sale, a media-wide garage sale um, every year. And what usually came out of that was that, you know, anything left over from the garage sales was left on the curb for the trash to pick up the next morning. And uh, we decided that we would have, we would create a free market uh, that weekend so that people could bring their leftovers to us. And we would have, uh, usually it was on a big lot. Um, we would allow people to come and take whatever they would like for free. Um, and this was, this was extremely popular, so much so that we, I think we normally would uh, create traffic jams on the street outside the lot, uh, which led to a little bit of a uh, problem <laughs> with the police. <laughs> um, but we, you know, so, but it, it just really made us want to create a, uh, a year round free market that would uh, actually be indoors and um, not dependent on weather. Um, and it and luckily enough, uh, we a space opened up on uh, Media's Main Street, uh, part of a church, and so the rent was really uh, affordable. Um, and and so in June of 2014, we opened up a free store in the in the in the church, um, and it's it's really an amazing idea because. We, we sort of thought of it at, at first of uh, just keeping things out of landfill, right? But it's, it's also, it also has a lot of other benefits, one of which that we didn't really anticipate is people were really glad to have a place where they could downsize and bring their stuff that wasn't just gonna end up in, in the landfill or, uh, or Chester's incinerator, uh, to be more exact. Um, and it wasn't just getting, uh, you know, making money for somebody else. So it was a place where people could donate their stuff uh, that they no longer wanted, and um, and other people could take it for free, which uh, made them feel really good about it. Um, so we're not only benefiting the people who are getting it for free, we're also benefiting the people who are able to to um, uh, get rid of their stuff, unwanted stuff, uh, with a good conscience. Um, and it's so it's been a, a really amazing uh, that project in and of itself, but it's also completely run by volunteers, which is often challenging. Um, many of them are not really that familiar with Transition Town's concepts. And, and so we're, we've been doing a little bit of educating in terms of um, you know what, what the whole concept of sharing resources is about and, and why it's important to uh, to have people realize that you know they don't have to just throw things away and buy new ones, they could share them, and um, it would be a benefit both to them and to the other people who were, were able to uh, to take them. 
so it's uh, it's been a way of of again reaching people who would not necessarily really know about um, what a sharing economy might 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 look like, and they're invariably really proud of of what they're doing, what they're accomplishing in the free store uh, when they work there. So it's it's really for them it's a it's a labor of love as well, which is really great to see. Yeah, and I think that it is super interesting that a lot of the people who are active in the free store, the running of the free store, are people who otherwise may never have been involved with transition or understood anything really about transition. It's like another entry point, and they don't. It's not even that um, that we're that you're insisting that they do that work that that they. Um, that they're just doing the work they feel called to do. They don't need mm -hmm. to do more. They don't need to volunteer for other things that, and, and it's a vital part of the, you know, part of the whole. Um, and that's something that I have really um, come to realize that the multi multifacetedness of engaging in this old story, new story work or peace economy work, this, this, the work of, of, of helping people think, be thoughtful about um, how they how they um, find resources to get their needs met, how they participate in community, where they put their energy. That it can that you can bring people in in these um, in in different sort of modes of the spider web, for instance, and that it creates this net, a hole that holds up everybody. And not everybody has to be involved in everything to be all of that net to hold the the whole up that they can just do their part and that the net is created. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a it's it's really important because I think that you can become when you feel like everything is yours to do, that that prevents people from um, it prevents people it that it develops apathy in people people are like i can't i don't have enough energy to do everything i don't have enough right. resources i don't have enough time i don't i don't have what it takes personally you know i'm also an introvert the three of us are introverts i just don't have enough people time in me to be able to do everything right mm -hmm. and and so it prevents people from doing anything at all and the movement away from apathetic thinking to to community engagement to um it, it doesn't even have to be community focused to the engagement with with changing perspectives and changing your own um way of working in the world um just knowing that that maybe is your piece to do is a a, a wonderful first step so um so that's what is inspirational to me about the free store is that those people who are working in the free store and aren't really involved in transition so much, they're holding their part, their little piece, right? Mm -hmm. And and that that there's a lot, there's inspiration to take from that. Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah, I, I really, I really enjoy that. Um, so, uh, oh, gosh, there's, um, there's a concept in the local peace economy um, workbook where we talk about um, the ideas of, um, and it, it's very prevalent today. Like you see a lot of it, especially in social media um, where it's like me versus the world or us, my team or my group versus the, those, you know, these demonized others or, um, that there's a lot of black and white thinking around the camps that people fall into. And healing that woundedness of our culture is becoming really urgent. Um, I think even more urgent than it was say 10 years ago. And how is Transition Town addressing that? Like, does it come up in meetings? Does it come up in your work? Like how, it, you know, do you, do you, uh, do you feel it's as urgent? Maybe it's just me, but, um, you know, what, what's your thinking around that? Like where you're, you know, it's, it's we, it, that, that, that there's a we that we have to begin thinking about, like people, even people who disagree with me are connected to me, that we're interconnected and, and 
finding ways to be in relationship, in community relationship with people who perhaps think differently or feel differently or are actively engaging differently. Um, how, how do we bring, how, how does Transition Town address that? Well, um, we certainly have been talking about that, especially lately since the results of the election. Um, it's really been a, on a lot of people's minds. Um, but for the most part, I think the way we deal with it is that we just get on with our work. Um, and whoever wants to join us can join us. And it doesn't matter if they're Republican or Democrat or independent or libertarian or whatever they are, um, whether they're religious or not, and whether they're, you know, black or white, any, anything that um, would normally divide us is really totally irrelevant when you are trying to build a world that that um, is, is based on a vision that you want to see. So uh, I think, I think it's, it seems pretty obvious that most people want a world that is safe and healthy and um, is, a, is a good place to bring up their children uh, and that they they have a comfortable uh, a comfortable life in terms of the economy um, and they feel they feel connected and taken care of and they um, part of a caring community is one of the most important things that, that we can you know try to provide so it's um, it really we we sort of set all that aside I think pretty much when we uh, are engaged in the projects that we're working on and and it really almost never comes up you know who people are or what their what their uh, fundamental beliefs are because I think everybody in a sense wants the same things they want to be they want to be taken care of they want to be able to eat they want to be able to have a home and they want to feel like they belong somewhere. And then yeah, people are in, in service <laughs> to things that are bigger than what divides us. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. With my projects, I, I kind of had a wake up call with how cool transition town is because we did have the wagons at different homes. And I was very surprised to see both political signs beside the wagons. And I was like, wait a minute, there is common ground. And same with planting trees. We would walk up to someone's house and you tend to think environmentalists are all in one category. It's that us versus them, but it's not. It was, we saw both sides, both sides wanted trees, both sides wanted wagons, both sides wanted to be involved. So that was really a beautiful thing. And it really, really affected me that, hey, wait a minute, there really isn't, you don't have to believe in one thing to be in one category. We can all work together and make things better. Yeah, I think that that's what the media has since before COVID has been, uh, and you know, forever, I guess, is really trying to drive wedges between people into more and more finely tuned segments so that everyone's fighting against each other to get people to not pay attention to mm -hmm. what's really happening. But the reality I feel very strongly is that we are united by much more than what divides us. And I love the fact that, Shari, that what you just said about like, we just get on with the work right? That's like that you set that aside and just do the work. And that community doesn't come from, you know, who's in your, on your team, but that we're all on a team together and we're creating and doing creative things in our community. Um, that that's where communities built and where connections built and where friendships are built. And um, I think that that's a super important switch and that needs to be urgently uh, broadcasted to um, contradict the social media and the the media just the general media idea that we're we're all we're all too different from each other and should be at odds with each other um, I've grown very tired of the the um, everybody screaming at each other and mm -hmm. um, and has and have largely removed myself from social media and um because I, I i feel like it's become a um a way to divide instead of unite people yeah absolutely yeah and um yeah it's it, it, it is very um um it's just discouraging it's just, it, it's, <laughs> it discourages me that, that that this is where it is, but things like Transition Town and the, the local peace economy and the work that we're doing and mutual aid networks and all of these wonderful um, 
people who are growing their own food, uh, farming, you know, all of these projects are in their own way trying to be that little piece of the of the um, the spider web to build support. And if we can just merely like shift our focus to that that and get more people to see that these things are happening, that maybe there will be less concentration on this separation, the idea that we're separate um, individuals and separate from other people in our community. Um, let's see. Trying to look at my notes here about what else we might talk about. I think you wanted to have some examples of how we work with local government. Yeah, that would that would be helpful. Um, how you work with the, the other local entities that are powerful, um, because uh, you know we do live in in a system, right? Um, that is in place, and we and local governments are often much more receptive um, than national governments to new ideas. And so, yeah, do talk about yeah. that. Um, yeah, and I think in media has been uh, it's very much the ca the case that uh, the local government is pretty receptive to to a lot of our ideas. Um, and I've been attending the environmental advisory council meetings for years now. And one of the things that we collaborated with them on uh, was a composting program. And um, this came about really because. They were discussing ways to reduce the amount of trash that the borough creates, and it, um, you know, one of the ideas was to switch to a pay pay to throw uh, system instead of having a flat rate. People would be uh, charged for the amount of trash that they produce, um, which makes sense. Um, but it occurred to me that it might be better first to help them reduce that trash uh, before they have to pay for it. And um, and one of the most obvious ways of reducing your trash is to take the food waste out of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the uh, statistics are that it's about 30% of most people's trash. So that would be a significant decrease and, uh, and it would be doing a, a really great uh, service to the to the residents to be able to do something useful with their food waste instead of just throwing it in the trash and making the, the trash smell. So um, we had a, um, a, a person, Chris Peretti, who was, uh, who had a composting business in the borough. He's picking up uh, food waste from people in five gallon buckets on a subscription basis. So he had a few residents that he picked up from every week. Um, so we met with him and uh, discussed if uh, it would work for him to do that borough wide. Uh, and he was he was sure that we would that it would work and that we the place where he takes the food waste, uh, which is an, an app, local apple orchard would have enough space to handle all that, all the, uh, the additional food waste. So it took about four years and uh, two pilot programs. And, uh, and so I wanted to work out all the details with the borough, but, um, but ultimately uh, we, what we worked out was that the public works department, which already picks up trash and recycling in the borough is now picking up food and yard waste weekly from uh, all the residents who um, who have who want to uh, to use that service, and then food and yard waste is taken to the apple orchard, Linville orchards, to um, to be composted. And in fact, some of it actually uh, comes back to the residents um, a couple of times a year. They they are given some free compost um, that they can pick up. So it's it's really um, and it actually ends up. Uh, costing the borough less because the tipping fee for the food waste for the compost is less than the trash tipping fees. So they're basically doing the same amount of work with, um, with a, you know, for some of it would be a, a smaller, smaller fee. So it was really pretty exciting. And, and I think that we're, we're now trying to encourage other municipalities to, uh, to do that as well. Um, some of them are not set up quite as nicely as, as media is with their with their um, public works department, but uh, we're seeing what we can do to work that out. I love when you can find a win win situation uh, yes. for projects that it, you know, uh, 
there's always this thought that like, oh, if I have to get like government involved or, you know, officials or other people involved, I'm going to have to convince them. And, it's, you know, it's going to be, a, it's going to be an uphill climb. But the reality is, is that sometimes it just, it's an idea where that both, both parties can get their needs met out of it. And there's, it, it helps everybody, you know, yes, and exactly. I, I love it when it works like that. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're always looking for too, is that, you know, it's, stacking functions, making more than one uh, win out of uh, whatever project that we're working on is always a great thing. Yeah. And so I have one final uh, sort of vein of thought that I want to bring in here. So like transition, it, it, we as you can see, there's like a lot uh, of projects that are ongoing and it creates a lot of work and there's a lot of people working and it's like, I know that Transition Town also really emphasizes pleasure and and celebration and um, and having meetings that are about connection and not work and and really trying to um, uh, experience uh, and not have it be all work all work and no play right and so can you talk to me a little bit about how you bring the aspects of pleasure into it instead of always having to be work 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 sure I mean I it's really a part of everything we do, I think. I mean, even our steering meetings, which, you know, can be deadly dull to, in most uh, in most organizations, um, you know, they're, they're really just uh, sort of collaborative and, and, um, and fun. And we, we just, we, it's just basically talking like we're talking here. Um, and so we bring a lot of that to, uh, to everything we do, of course, you know, even the the work that to me it looks like hard work when you think about it you're planting trees is you know it's, there's always a joyful aspect to it which it's, it's really really exciting and so on we also do a lot of little community events like um you know we have a fire circles group um that you know on, on good weather and, and um during the evenings uh, sometimes we'll just have a fire pit and get gather around and just just talk and just enjoy each other. And, you know, maybe sometimes there's music, sometimes um, there's a topic, but most of the time it's just, you know, getting together and uh, chatting with people. Um, we also have, we also focus a lot on volunteer appreciation is what we call it. Uh, so we have a couple of um, times a year that we uh, celebrate the food, uh, free store volunteers by having a dinner together and, you know, combine it with a meeting usually to, there's always something to talk about, but, um, but mostly just getting together the whole, the whole group and uh, having some, some food and some talk, some talk and just to get together. One of the things that we used to do that um, we did a couple of years uh, in a row was um, what we called happiness week. That was that was always really fun. It was a lot of work because there was you know uh, events every day for all week, and one of the things we did then was this flash mob. I'm sure you remember it, Marie, <laughs> where we actually uh, we had to shut down uh, State Street <laughs> because uh, the crowd got a lot bigger than we anticipated, and uh, we had not asked for permission to do that beforehand. So we got into a heap of trouble for it, but it was so much fun. And I remember the mayor, we were uh, uh, we were at a meeting or an event with the mayor and he was uh, sometime after that. And he was saying, uh, he was talking about that Happiness Week event. And um, he said, you know, and it was it was really a bad thing that you did closing that stage street without permission. That was really, really terrible. And I was sitting there going, oh God. <laughs> and, he's, and then he says, so uh, when were you planning on doing it again? <laughs> so, oh okay <laughs> yeah it was terrible but man it was a lot of fun <laughs> ask for forgiveness yeah not, exactly. not permission no we just did, we just didn't know that it was going to create so much of a disturbance oh it my just goodness it was it was amazing yeah. but um yeah so things like that and we we also had um we have events like uh media open streets where we shut down a number of streets this time with permission uh, before um uh, for an afternoon and um, and have people just be able to walk and and chat and dance and do whatever they want to do in the streets without any traffic um, coming along and that was always a, a really fun event um, we had organizations with tables 
uh, doing different activities. Um, Earth and State was out there making pottery from local clay and, and kids were just swarming all around him. Um, it was, that's, that was a really great, great event. Unfortunately, we had to stop because of COVID. Um, but then we also did some street mural um, painting on, uh, on a, some intersections in, near, in media. And again, it was the sort of thing that, you know, you just get a lot of volunteers together, paint the streets and people will walk by and say, what are you doing? And <laughs> this is really interesting looking. And, um, you know, so we get to talk to people about um, community and, and uh, the importance of art in the community and the importance of just getting together and having fun. So yeah, well, that's, a number of fun that's, things to do. That's perfect. Yeah, that's, I think, a really good place to to uh, wind down this conversation. Uh, we've gone a little a bit over an hour, but um, being in community can be very pleasurable. And um, and often, it, you know, that I think that that's something that's often overlooked, that it feels like it's work all the time. But um, there's so much beauty, especially when you're co-creating and painting together and doing these really fun projects and, and having fun together, that that's when people come alive. And so... Um, that's always been a real inspiration to me about the work that Transition Town Media does. So thank you both for um, coming on and talking with me today. Thank you, Julie, for for the work you're doing and Shari for your continued work for, gosh, it's been, what, 15 years now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a lot of work. And um, I appreciate you both. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you.